I saw Pete on the Smothers Brothers in 1966, and, you know, that was around the time I was starting to play guitar, and, and uh, it's always been, I've never, as a musician, I've never known, not, not known who Pete Seeger was, so, so I've never, I've, it never occurred to me that activism and music didn't go together. So Pete and my great uncle used to dance together in Margaret Mayo's American Square Dancers group. And I grew up as many kids did, you know, going to Clearwater and seeing Pete and you know, I often tell some of uh, the younger kids that Pete was my Michael Jackson, you know. Um, so I went to see him in Bryant Park uh, a couple of years ago when his book came out. I went up to him and he I had been talking about his memory a little bit and so I really didn't expect anything but I said my uncle Byron used to dance with you in the American Square Dancers group and he looked at me and he said Byron Menendez <laughs> and you know I nearly burst into tears and Byron Menendez is my great uncle and Pete looked at me and he said, my long-term memory is pretty good, it's the short-term that, you know, does it, is it great, but it was a wonderful moment, very meaningful for me, we took a couple pictures and I, I will treasure that forever. Yeah, I, um, Sarah Lee and I will be married 15 years this October 2014, and uh, I first really met Pete at our wedding, he played, he came to the wedding that day and uh, and we had a big hoot nanny in Arlo played and it was a beautiful, beautiful fall day in the Berkshires. So uh, that was the beginning. And uh, I think once Toshi uh, knew that I had a good heart, uh, she kind of told him and you know, I was in. You know, as a songwriter and someone that has a moral compass to some degree, he, he made it. He made it possible to sing songs that, that say what's on your mind, you know, and um, he and Woody and even Lead Belly and Sonny Terry and, you know, uh, they just open the doors for people that have a conscience to to really dig in and, and write those songs. Um, so it's a flagship, you know. You know, when I came up in high school and we played, you know, Rust of Roots started out playing Benefits and pretty much like potluck dinners, like that was our tour of Pittsburgh, you know, we had probably like two or three shows a week, you know, and, but Pete Seeger was this uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to say a, like a, like a deity in a way, you know, he was, he was talked about, but we, we're so young that we didn't really know that much about him. And um, so now being here and, and being asked to do this, I feel like I'm finally getting like an intimate connection with him. Oh, it was at the city winery and um, it was the oil spill. It was a benefit for the oil spill. And uh, I was in that little room to the left there of the stage, which you can only get into it via that. There's no way in or out. You just can only go in, in there. So I'm in there on my own, and uh, in comes Pete, and he gets uh, this piece of paper out, and he's he's learning a new song. It's called "Spill Baby Spill," and uh, he's going over the words and he's strumming with his banjo, and and I'm kind of just like playing quietly behind him. I can I'm kind of copying the changes because it's Pete Singer, and I'm like you know there he is, and I'm just playing along with him. And then um, there's an announcement from the stage. It's okay. Uh, uh, Pete, Pete C is going to play, and he, mo he he moves towards the door, and I'm at the door with him. I'm just kind of talking to him, and then uh, just as about to go on, he says, "Why don't you come on and play it with me? Come on, come, come and play it with me." I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> so he like, so I walk on, and there's Pete, and I plug in, and he starts the song, and. You know, you can see me kind of just trying to follow the changes. And um, that's how I got to play with Pete, you know, he's an inclusive guy, you know, he just wanted to include everybody. And his whole his whole thing was was the collective, you know, the power of the collective, the, the sound of the collective voice, the feeling of your own power as, as a group. You know, that was his beauty. That's why we loved him. <laughs> I do remember making pottery at their house in Beacon and crying because I didn't want to leave and I made a little pot, I think it was a tinea. 
um, and that's something I'll never forget. <laughs> uh, actually, the first time that the first like memory of Pete that I have is we were hanging out backstage in Carnegie and. You know, Pete's walking down the hall and he's doing rhythms like he always does back then. And uh, my little cousin was scared because he's just this big guy walking down the walking down the hall. I just remember, don't worry about it. It's just Pete. You're fine. <laughs> he just got that presence was about. He was also about, you know, taking music from all over the world and sharing it with everybody. And some of the coolest things I've seen is playing Carnegie Hall without Pete. It's a whole different audience than when he comes up on stage because you know people are you know they, they applaud and they, they laugh at the jokes but when Pete's there it's like everybody's there having a great time singing along on everything it's just amazing it just has that presence and that energy that gets everybody going he just he meant all of it you could just tell he was a no bullshit person actually committed to change and love and he was just doing he was doing it for all the right reasons you know, I have a lot of friends doing it all for the right reasons, and we all know that we're all imperfect. I don't think anyone thinks that Pete Seeger was a perfect person, but his message looked perfect. <laughs> and sometimes that's all you need is a great ambassador to go out there and just constantly not just fucking talk about it, but walk the walk. And he, he lived according to his principles. He lived a life of love and connection. It's so impressive.